input. So we know that the sensory input, whether it's internal or external, is transduced electrically. So when we're seeing, we're making sense of the information. When we're smelling, touching, feeling the temperature, you know, what would the temperature be like in this room? And what would be the sense like? What would it be like if somebody that you really liked was here? And it was a surprise and it was so exciting and a big hug. Um, and so we notice when um, our heart starts beating faster for whatever reason, if we're excited because we see somebody we really like. So that's your internal and your external. It's all sensory input that we're making sense of. Our balance, our position, the angle things are at. Um, we're making sense of it all. perceiving it. So perceiving is a good word to be using. And then what happens if we were to recall this lovely day where we went to this lovely place and we met somebody we really loved, it was a surprise. And when we recall that, what happens is we activate the receptors that we made when we were having that experience and we there's traffic neural traffic flows through them and that signals for a change in our chemistry and we experience that as case and we might uh we might picture what we saw um it might be that we've just been looking at that wee palm tree so we might picture that and we might have uh you know, we might use schema in our brain, little love hearts and a text like, oh, my love, or um, and we might picture that. Um, or it might be that we're not somebody so much who accesses our imagery, cognitive visual. We might more access what we said to ourselves, like, wow, that was a surprise, or something they said to us, like some really nice thing they said to us, maybe we keep playing that again and again in our head. And of course it can be the other way if we um, we were in this beautiful place and we got a fright or if we went to this place and we're allergic to these things or perhaps that's how we become allergic we're in a place like that and we get a fright and we encode everything so we encode the scents and the molecules really that are in there so that when we come across those molecules again our brain matches them to the receptors we made and says, oh, oh, we need to run survival function. We need to we need to survive. We need to get out of here. So it's really so useful to be thinking this way. Thinking about the meaning that we give. You know, if our heart's beating fast, do we think, oh, I'm excited or I'm scared? Or what meaning do we give things? Do we think we're trapped? And then all of these experiences... Um, and how we build our landscape results in how we predict things are going to go. And then obviously when we predict things, we're going to be looking for certain things to happen. We're going to be expecting, predicting, anticipating. And then later on, when we're, when we're working with people, we're going to be using this exact same mechanism, but we're going to use it uh, deliberately and we're probably going to be using words, although... We also use our expressions and our movement and so forth, but we're mostly going to be using words, and so we call them cues. So I, I rather use the scientific word than cues for everything rather than talking about glimmers and triggers, because that's adding meaning. So I just like to keep it neutral, cues, especially with Havening, because people's response to a cue is going to change so much. It's probably going to change, say we're doing event Havening, response to cues going to be um, you know, scared, recoil, survival system, then they're going to go to kind of neutral as they go down the B scale to zero, and then they're going to be up the B scale as they start to change their response to that stimuli, where they start to realise, oh, I, I really like that, that's great. So, um, so I like to, it helps create the space for that change to happen, if you say cue, rather than saying trigger to glimmer. 
and it and it allows it kind of opens it up and it's more scientifically uh, correct.